Good morning. I know people. And it's not from any psychology classes I've taken because I haven't taken any. I just have this innate understanding of people and their motivations. I sell flowers. You can understand a lot about people by the flowers they buy. And it's true that lovers buy roses and all, but the insights you can get from flower purchases run deeper than that. I suppose I should think about becoming a psychologist, but then my whole knowing people thing would be a job. I'm happy with it being a gift. So, I sell flowers every day here on the street corner. That's my job. And I figure out why people buy the flowers they buy. That's my gift. Have a nice day. In the florist game, we have what you call regulars, but they're not regulars in the regular sense. They aren't regulars because they buy flowers every week. They're regulars because they buy flowers on holidays that require flowers. I'll see the same people on Valentine's Day as I do on Mother's Day and Memorial Day and maybe an extra time when their kid goes to homecoming. And I always know what they're buying the flowers for. So. When Mrs. Gonzalez, who has six children, comes to buy flowers in May, it's because one of the kids is going to prom. Like I said, I know people. I do have one really regular regular, and that's Mr. Goldberg. Mr. Goldberg has been buying flowers from me for about two years. Every day. For two years. Each and every day, Mr. Goldberg drops by my stand at around 9 a.m. and buys a bouquet I've come to call the Goldberg Bouquet. It's a collection of butterfly asters, daisy palms, mini carnations, cushion palms, and large carnations. And the colors. When Mr. Goldberg walks away with that bouquet, it simply lights up his face. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Goldberg. Good morning, darling. Here's your bouquet. The Goldberg bouquet. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Here you go. Same as always. The price hasn't gone up, Mr. Goldberg. Hmm. The price did go up eight months ago, but I didn't have the heart to charge him anymore. I assume he's no longer working, and he's probably on some kind of a fixed income. And he always pays cash, so I never lose anything for the merchant fees when people give me credit cards. He probably gets some kind of a pension and goes to the bank to get cash because he looks to me like a man who'd prefer not to owe anything. I've come to have the bouquet ready for him every morning so he doesn't have to wait for me to put it together. Right before I shut down for the day, I make up the Goldberg bouquet and I think of Mr. Goldberg. Now... Despite knowing people as I do, I often felt I didn't really know Mr. Goldberg. Like I said, he didn't fit into the regular mold, so it was hard to know exactly what he was buying the bouquet every day for. At first, I thought he was simply a man who enjoyed life, so that every day alive was a celebration. I guess he was around 85 years old, so to him, every day alive must have been a miracle. But no one buys flowers for themselves. Not every day, anyway. So, I took it upon myself to study Mr. Goldberg a little more closely and to ask him a few well-placed questions that might reveal to me more about who he was. Here you go, Mr. Goldberg. You must have a whole bunch of flowers to throw away every week, huh? I mean, they don't last forever. So who does? Okay, so now I was on to something. That simple answer... So who does? Told me a lot about Mr. Goldberg. First of all, it confirmed my theory that he was celebrating life. In other words, Mr. Goldberg used the flowers as a metaphor for the brevity of life. And, despite the fact that his remaining life was probably briefer than most, he could find beauty. I can tell you that not many people buy flowers as metaphors, but that was the way his mind worked. 
and I knew this. But I also knew that he was not buying flowers for himself. Why spend the money? Looking is free. He could have easily stood by my flower cart, or any garden in the city for that matter, and saw beauty without having to pay for it. And isn't that what beauty should be? Free for all? You shouldn't have to pay for it, because when you do, it's somebody else's definition of beauty. And you have to pay for that. It sucks. And that's not from any philosophy class I've taken, because I haven't taken any. So, anyway, I realized that Mr. Goldberg was not buying these flowers for himself. He was buying them for someone else. But who? He's always alone. But that doesn't mean he didn't have a wife. Maybe she's sick, and he's buying her flowers to cheer her up. Or maybe she's fine, but doesn't like to get out. Maybe she's got agoraphobia, fear of the marketplace, and people with agoraphobia do not generally go out of the house because they're panic-stricken. So Mr. Goldberg is buying her flowers every day so she can feel better and not so panicked. It had to be, and I knew it. I had to get Mr. Goldberg talking about Mrs. Goldberg, so another carefully placed question was in order. Mr. Goldberg, what's your wife's name? Helen, darling. Price go up? The price hasn't gone up, Mr. Goldberg. Good. Everything else does. Everything else does. That, too, was a clue. He's conscious of what things cost, especially his daily bouquet. If it goes up, would he be able to pay for it? More importantly, if he's buying them for Helen Goldberg, maybe it's not because he wants to, which is why he's worried about price. It's not an expense he planned to incur in his old age, but Helen is making him purchase the flowers because she wants her house decorated with them. That's why he's always alone. That's why he calls me darling. He's miserable at home, and Helen's the reason why. She's forcing flowers on him. That's good for business, but not for Mr. Goldberg. Now, it was time to get some facts about his situation, just to confirm what I already knew. So the questions, though well-placed, had to be more direct. Mr. Goldberg, how long are you married? Fifty-three years. How many kids do you have? Two. Any Uh grandchildren? Uh, Four. What did you do for a living? Tailoring. And your wife? Housewife. And these flowers are for your wife? Uh, I wish. So why not give them to her? Because, darling, she died. I knew it! I just knew it! These flowers were not for her because she's gone. And so was his heart. You can see it in his face. They lived and loved for 53 years, had two children together, and now he buys her flowers every day to put on her gravesite. And he doesn't have to get rid of the old flowers because he paid for something called perpetual care, and the cemetery takes care of all that. I know, because my grandfather's grave is that way. It has perpetual care. Every Memorial Day, my father puts flowers on his father's grave, and the next year they're gone. Imagine if she's in the same cemetery as my grandpa. She may be. Helen Goldberg. I can look it up online. Let's try the St. Bartholomew's Cemetery website. Nope, no Goldberg there. Maybe Green Valley Methodist? No, not there. Well, there's a Jewish cemetery in town, so maybe... Here she is! Helen Goldberg. A lot of Sanskrit on this site. And that's not from any archaeology class I've taken, because I haven't taken any. This must be it. Uh Uh-huh. I'm going to see her. I want to see my flowers so lovingly placed on her tombstone. That's beauty, and it's free, like beauty should be.
be here. All this Sanskrit. I'm glad there's some English. Helen Goldberg! Here it is! Oh, it's a dual gravestone like my grandparents have. Where are my flowers? There's no flowers here. But he bought the bouquet today, hours ago. He had to have come here to decorate the tombstone. Is it possible that perpetual care is that efficient? Well, maybe not. There's all these rocks on her tombstone. What the hell is the matter with people today? No respect for the dead. There are rocks on almost all the tombstones. Oh my god, what have we come to? I was disappointed there were no flowers on Helen's grave. But as I was traveling to the cemetery, I was having second thoughts about my theory. Mr. Goldberg can hardly get around. I can't expect him to make that trip every day just to put flowers on a tombstone. I know there's something I'm not thinking of, and it's getting me annoyed. I don't want to be annoyed at Mr. Goldberg, but he's not giving me the answers I need to know his story. For goodness sake, I don't even know his first name or where he lives. What is your name and where do you live? What? You heard me, your first name. It's Max, darling. And where do you live, Max? Darling, just over there. At 223, the big building there. I know the building. Third floor? Here's your bouquet, and the price goes up next week. (sighs) And what did he mean by that? Third floor at 223. If that wasn't an invitation, I don't know what is. (gasps) That's the piece I was missing! It's not the flowers he wants, it's me! He buys the flowers so he can talk to me, and then he goes home and throws them out! I know it! I gave him the benefit of the doubt all this time, but I just knew there was something sinister about him. And with Helen, dead. Well, he's probably lonely. I'm young enough to be his great-great-granddaughter. My God, just what have we become? We throw away perfectly good flowers so we can flirt. We throw rocks on the tombstones of dead people. We have become something I never thought we could become. And I don't even know what that is. But I know I'm right. And that's not from any sociology class I've taken because I haven't taken any. Well, I'm going up to the third floor of building 223 and I'm going to face my attacker. And I'm going to let him have it. I'm going to tell him I saw through him from day one because I know people. And I'm going to tell him not to buy flowers for me anymore because I'm not his little darling. And I'm going to tell him to respect his dead wife and get those rocks off her tombstone. The Goldberg bouquet will be no more. Goldberg! Darling, you rang? Yes! You didn't even ask who it was. Were you expecting me, maybe? Not you, no. Well, you must have a whole stable of young girls ready to come by. Young girls? Your wife of 53 years is dead. I know that, darling. I know it, too. I was there with all the rocks on the tombstone. Rocks? Damn it, Mr. Goldberg. Just what is your intention towards me? Do you think I'm some (laughs) schoolgirl? I am so much worldlier than that, Max. I know who you are and what you are, and I am here to tell you that I know you, Max Goldberg. Those flowers in the vase on the table, the ones I sell you every morning, do you replace that every day? Yes, darling. Why? Because it should be fresh, just in case. In case of what? In case someone comes. Someone like me? No, darling. My children, my grandchildren. In case they come visit me, it'll look nice. And how often do they visit? They... (sighs) Never do. They never do? No, darling. Not yet.
When was the last time you saw them? Probably... Maybe... Two years ago. When Helen died, I saw the date on the tombstone. <sighs> so you buy the flowers so that your apartment will look nice just in case your children come to visit. And the bouquet you replace the new flowers with? In the garbage. At the end of the day, I toss it out and start again the next morning. It's what they do to you, isn't it? Toss you out when you're no longer fresh. But you always start again in the morning, darling. I didn't see Mr. Goldberg after that. I don't think he died or anything. I just think he was too embarrassed to come back. Or maybe he didn't want to embarrass me. There are other florists around, so he didn't really need me. But I'll bet none of them have the Goldberg bouquet. Today, I continue to observe people and conclude things about them by the flowers they buy. Mrs. Gonzalez still comes by in May to buy flowers. She told me that four of her children were born in May. They must love flowers. Like I said, I know people. The Flower Stand was written by Robert Cooperman and produced by Catherine Ranella and Ryan Van Bibber. This story is featured as part of the MAT Script Writing Competition Winners Collection of 2013 through 2014. Featuring the voice talents of Elizabeth Harlick as Alyssa and Jacob Browning as Mr. Goldberg. Music provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com as permitted under a Creative Commons license. The executive producer is Dan Michalko. This has been a Meridi Media Midnight Audio Theater production. <laughs>